ladies and gentlemen, Steve Gold. Yes. So uh, one day in the fall of 1968, at the beginning of my senior year in college at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, I sat down at my desk and I wrote a letter to all the historically black colleges in the United States, begging them for a job. I was a conscientious objector to the war in Vietnam and I needed to find some socially relevant work to do when I graduated or they were gonna draft my ass off to fight in the war. <laughs> And I did not want to go. What I wanted to do was to teach. And so I was hoping to find a college that was so poor and hard up that they would be willing to hire somebody like me with only a bachelor's degree and no experience. <laughs> Most of the places that I wrote to ignored me. 30 of them wrote back to tell me how totally unqualified I was. <laughs> Two of them interviewed me, and one offered me a job, which I accepted. That was Kittrell Junior College in Kittrell, North Carolina. So the following spring, I graduated from college. I married my longtime girlfriend, Linda, and off we went to Kittrell, North Carolina, population 427. <laughs> we, we arrived looking like Bob Dylan and Joan Baez. We, we had long hair and beads and bell bottoms, and we looked around. Kittrell was just a wide spot on a two-lane country road. It had a gas station, a post office, and a general store. Nothing in our lives had prepared us for the rural south, certainly not Ann Arbor, and, and not our hometown of Skokie, Illinois, near Chicago. For one thing, there were no black people in Skokie. It was 100% white. And it was 100% Christian, except for me and my buddy Mitchell, who were the only two Jewish kids in our class, so if there was any ethnic diversity in my hometown, I was it. <laughs> Kittrell was not Ann Arbor and it was not Skokie. What it was was the Jim Crow South. Most of the people there were black, but all the institutions and businesses were owned and run by white people. So shortly after we got there, I went into the post office to get some stamps. The man in front of me, who was black, bought a sheet of stamps, and I heard the clerk charge him $6.10. Then I bought exactly the same sheet of stamps, and I was charged $6. Huh. So I told Linda about this, and she said, well, it's the United States Post Office. They couldn't possibly have charged him more for stamps because he was black. And I agreed that didn't seem possible, so we just set that aside. A few days later, we went into a drugstore, and when we went up to the the counter to pay, there was an elderly black couple ahead of us. We walked up, and they stepped out of our way, like we were royalty. Naturally, we said, no, you were here first. Please, please go ahead. But they wouldn't. They just stood there with their heads down, waiting for the white folks. This was confusing and embarrassing to us. It was an early lesson in the politics of skin color in North Carolina. We used to go home from teaching and watched Jesse Helms broadcast terrible racist editorials all over the South. Jesse Helms was kind of the Rush Limbaugh of his time. And Jesse Helms would say things like, crime and irresponsibility among the Negroes are simply facts of life which we must face. Jesse Helms hated the University of North Carolina, UNC, because it was liberal. He always referred to it as the University of Negroes and Communists. Well, we thought Jesse Helms was disgusting, but Jesse Helms was a hero to white people in North Carolina. So we didn't have many black friends because black people did not trust us, and we didn't have many white friends because, as Linda put it, the white people in Kittrell, North Carolina are a whole lot whiter than we are. <laughs> and in fact, she began to worry that my long hair made me look even more different, and she said, you better cut your hair. Well, we did have some friends among our students who were all black, and they were just a few years younger than we were. And in particular, we became friends with a young man from Dover, Delaware, named Wayne Crapper. That was his name, Wayne Crapper. <laughs> Wayne had gotten into some kind of trouble back in Dover, and his parents and a judge decided to send him to Kittrell to separate him from his evil companions. Well, Wayne was smart and funny and urban and knew what was going on in the world, so we began to hang out together, especially on the weekends. 
But in Kittrell, North Carolina, white people and black people did not hang out together. That was race mixing, and it was wrong. So one Saturday, Linda wanted to drop off some dry cleaning, and the three of us went into town together. And when Linda and Wayne and I walked into the dry cleaners, the white lady behind the counter kind of flinched. Linda walked up to her, and the lady leaned over the counter and said, tell me, are y'all part of a motorcycle gang? <laughs> oh, yeah, that seemed funny at the time, that, that Linda and Wayne and I could be part of a motorcycle gang. But it was not so funny the following weekend when the movie Easy Rider opened. As you recall, in the final scene of Easy Rider, two long-haired, motorcycle-riding hippies are shot to death by southern rednecks. Linda and I sat there, shocked and stunned, while everybody else in the theater whooped and clapped and applauded and thought that was the greatest thing that they had ever seen. I will tell you this, I was glad that I had listened to my wife and cut my long hair. Well, we didn't last a long time in Kittrell, and the final straw was Moratorium Day. That was a national day of protest against the war in Vietnam. We decided that we would recognize Moratorium Day by reading to our classes Eldridge Cleaver's essay, The Black Man's Stake in Vietnam from Soul on Ice. In Soul on Ice, Eldridge Cleaver says, the reason so many black troops are being sent to Vietnam is to kill off the cream of our black youth. And he said, black people should not go to another country to fight for freedoms which they do not have here at home for themselves. And he said, black men should not allow themselves to go to another country and be used to slaughter another people that are fighting to be free. Well, the Kittrell College administration had not hired us to teach Eldridge Cleaver <laughs> and black revolutionary politics to their students, and in December they fired us. So at Christmas time, we drove home, dropping Wayne off in Dover along the way. The 700-mile car trip back to Ann Arbor gave us plenty of time to think about what had happened to us. And we talked about how lonely we had been, because we were alienated and isolated from everybody around us, both black and white. And we talked about how guilty we had felt, because our white skin gave us white skin privilege, and unearned privilege and power over other people that we didn't want. And we talked about how the college had paid us pretty well, but we paid a price too because we had had to spend the first four months of our married life together embedded in a terrible racist society. So we were still thinking and talking about those things two years later in 1971 when we took our second significant trip. Our friends Chuck and Sandy had set off to travel around the world. And they wrote to us from the, isle, the island of Bali in the South Pacific that we should come and join them. And we thought that was a great idea, but by the time we had quit our jobs and got our passports and made our final travel arrangements, Chuck and Sandy had moved on, and we were no longer to meet them on the island of Bali, but in Kabul, Afghanistan. So our trip overland by bus across Turkey and Iran actually went pretty well. Uh, Turkey and Iran at that time, they were westernized, modern nations that did a lot of business with the United States, and our white skins were just fine. The people were educated, tolerant Muslims. They didn't care what religion we were. They loved our American dollars, and they just wanted us to buy their stuff. Well, that all changed when we crossed the border into Afghanistan. After a 75-mile trip bumping across the desert in the back of a truck, we arrived in the city of Herat. To our surprise, the people of Herat did not want us to buy their stuff. In fact, they seemed to hate us. They shouted things at us and scowled when we walked by. They spat at our feet. Their children were encouraged to throw stones at us. It was worse for Linda than it was for me. The very few women that we saw on the street were covered head to foot in burqas. Well, it was summer, it was 110 degrees or more every day, and Linda did not wear a burqa. She wore jeans and a t-shirt. In that culture, there was only one word for a woman who would show her face and the shape of her body to a man who was not her husband. And I knew that that's what they were shouting at her. I could do nothing to defend her. These people carried knives and rifles and swords. No, the Afghans did not want us there. They had been kicking Westerners out of their country since Alexander the Great. And we were just the, the latest white-skinned infidels to come along. 
We weren't privileged in Afghanistan. We weren't even safe. That was proved uh, to a higher degree several weeks later when we finally caught up with Chuck and Sandy in Kabul. It was Sandy's birthday, and we decided to have dinner in the best restaurant in town. That was the restaurant in the Intercontinental Hotel. So we walked up to the revolving door that led into the lobby, but our way was blocked by a huge Afghan doorman. He folded his arms and said, no hippies. <laughs> we explained that we were not hippies. We were American tourists, and we were having dinner in the restaurant. No hippies. There was a standoff. Finally, Sandy said, can I go in by myself and speak to the manager? That was OK. And Sandy went through the door and disappeared into the lobby. Well, after a few minutes, Chuck got very nervous about not knowing exactly where his wife was, so he dodged around the doorman and started through the door. The doorman grabbed the edge of the door and wrenched it backwards, hurling Chuck onto the ground. Chuck jumped up and charged the doorman, who threw him aside. Chuck looked at me, I nodded, and the real fight was about to begin. <laughs> Suddenly, the manager was there standing between us. He was wearing a tuxedo, and I remember he was smoking a cigarette in a long cigarette holder. He said in perfect English, if you do not leave immediately, I will have you put in jail. Well, we were mad, but we weren't crazy. <laughs> and we knew that if we disappeared into an Afghan jail, we might never get out again. So we slunk away, humiliated. We had no status, we had no power, we had no privilege at all. To those Afghans, we were the N-word. Well, it was time to leave Afghanistan. And I went to the bus terminal to get tickets down through the Khyber Pass, into Pakistan, and down into India, our destination. The sign on the wall gave the bus ticket prices. Two tickets would be $50. But when I went up to pay for the tickets, the price was more than $50. Why is the price more? There is a surcharge. What is the surcharge for? Well, it turned out that the surcharge was bakshish, a bribe that Westerners had to pay to the bandits in the Khyber Pass so they wouldn't stop the bus and rob us. Only Westerners would be robbed because they had cash and traveler's checks. The local people didn't have anything worth stealing. So I have to pay more for my bus tickets because I have white skin? That was robbery. I began to understand how that man felt who had to pay more for his postage stamps back in Kittrell. Well, we finally made it down into India, and things were good again. Our white skins were fine, our religion was fine, our money was fine. And in Hindu India, women's bodies could be admired again. And Linda went into the marketplace and bought some fabric and had a tailor make her a dress that showed off her curves. But we still had to pay more in India. We had to pay the English price. When the British had ruled India, and that had ended less than 25 years earlier, the English were too proud and haughty, too high class, to bargain in the marketplace like the Indians did. They just paid the English price, whatever that was. To the Indians, we Americans were the same as the English, and we were expected to pay the English price too. Well, at first we argued, but then we stopped. It usually was just a matter of a few pennies that didn't make too much difference to us, but it meant a lot, a lot to them. We had more, and we were expected to pay more. This was not racism. It was not robbery. It was simply social class, and it made a kind of sense. So that was, that was white skin privilege in the Indian marketplace. People who had a little more money got around in the cities by traveling on bicycle rickshaws. That's a three-wheel bicycle with a seat in the back and the driver up front. One time, our driver was old and ill. And when we came to the first hill, he wasn't strong enough to pedal us up. So he dismounted and started to push. Well, we couldn't sit there while an old sick man pushed us up a hill. So we tried to get down. He was insulted. I can do my job. And he made us get back on again. So we did let an old sick man push us up a hill. That was worse than going to the front of the line in the Kittrell drugstore. Uh, on all of our trips, on our trip to Afghanistan and to India and to Kittrell, 
I learned that whenever I crossed a border or went someplace new, there could be a renegotiation of how I was perceived in the eyes of other people. Sometimes my, my accent, my nationality, my beliefs, or most of all, my skin color could give me unearned privilege, and sometimes it could take all my privileges away. The lessons that I learned on those early trips served me well today in the diversity and inclusion work that I get to do for One Macomb. Thank you. Steve Gold. <laughs>